And earlier today, we were following live the plenary session at the UN in which 187 countries have voted in favor of the lifting of the U.S. embargo of Cuba against only two votes and one abstention. And now we welcome political analyst Danny Sho, who is joining us to further analyze what happened today at the UN headquarters. Danny, it's a pleasure to welcome you to From the South. What, what are the, for you the implications of yet another vote in favor of the lifting of the U.S. embargo? Uh, good morning, Belen from Los Angeles. It's uh, truly sad that year after year, the member countries of the United Nations speak for the world's people, speak for the oppressed countries, the exploited countries, the misnamed third world countries, and the vast majority of the world's people are completely against this economic and military suffocating blockade of the Cuban people that's been in fact for six years now, just as these same masses of people across the world are against Israeli and U.S. aggression against the Palestinian people. But we see once again the land that the United Nations is a joke. The United Nations is a plaything in the hands of the Western imperial powers so that they have a camouflage or a fig leaf to pretend that they care about the world's people from Cuba to Palestine to Haiti, when in fact they don't. And they've never stopped any of these aggressive imperialist wars against the countries that I've mentioned. Now, Danny, you were just saying year after year, the international community boasts to lift lift this embargo. The UN itself has issued reports stating that the coercive measures imposed by the US on Cuba do not abide by the rule of law. However, up to now the embargo has not ceased to condition the Cuban population. Today we witnessed an overwhelming support of the international community to the Cuban cause. Is there reason to believe we might be at a political turning point? We have a stronger G77 group, an expanding BRICS group demanding a multipolar world. How are you reading this scene? There's no question that multipolarity is on the rise, but it's a difficult transition. These are difficult birth pains because the birth pains um, right now are, 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 are happening over the blood and bones of 1.1 million uh, children in Gaza, China, in, in, in Russia, in the Bolivarian camp, uh, diplomatically, they're putting up a lot of resistance. We hear Gustavo Petro in the Bolivians and countries around the world are boycotting uh, the Zionist entity, but it's not enough. How do we save life? And, and the Cuban people feel this, and people across South America and Africa and the Middle East, there's a natural kinship with the people of Gaza and with the Palestinian people. But right now, the enemy, the imperialist enemy, the Zionist enemy is very strong. Uh, they control the informational war, they control the economic war, and this massive bombardment, this, this encirclement, this siege of, of, of Gaza, how are the Palestinian people going to live? So across the world, uh, from Cuba to northern Nigeria to Palestine, how can we sleep when watching a, a, a holocaust of our beautiful Palestinian sisters and brothers and children? Exactly. And of course, the voting today also shows the connection between the U.S. embargo and this international scene. Um, only U.S. and Israel were the countries who um, voted against the resolution. As the U.S. continues to back the massacre of the Palestinian people in Gaza, despite the outcry of the international community, also the only country who abstained from the vote was Ukraine, another country with its, its own political and military ties with the U.S. Uh, in the current political scene, how do you understand the U.S. embargo on Cuba in the light of this political scene? And why does the U.S. insist on maintaining it? The siege of Cuba, the siege of Venezuela, the siege of Nicaragua, the siege of Russia, the siege of China, the siege of Vietnam, the siege of Palestine, it's all interconnected. And if we go back and we study El Doctor Ernesto Che Guevara, and we study some of the great ideologues of tricontinentalism and, and the unity of oppressed people, we see that a victory for the Palestinians is a victory for the Cubans, a victory for the Angolans is a victory for the Portuguese working class. So. The only way we can confront this axis of genocide, the United States and Israel and Zionism, this is an axis of genocide. With 2.4 million Palestinian lives hanging in the balance, this can only be met by the unification of the world's people into an axis of life, an axis of unity, pan-Arabism, pan-Caribbeanism, pan-Muslim uh, 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 unity. Uh, it's only the world's people that can stop this Holocaust. 
the Zionists in the U.S. are not going to stop it because the U.S. is looking to force Iran, Hezbollah, and the axis of resistance, indigenous to the Middle East, into a war so that they have a, a medium, an informational justification, bombs away over Tehran, bombs away over Beirut. And, and the countries of the region want peace, but Zionism in the U.S., the axis of genocide, want more war. The political scene that you're describing is clear. We will continue to further analyze this scenario. I thank you, Danny Show, political analyst, for joining us today.